well, YouTube fans, subscribers, we made it. We made it through the entire director's commentary of Masters of the Universe Classics, which kind of blows my mind. Um, as just framework, and if you're watching this video as your first, you might want to go back and watch the series. This is sort of the afterthoughts. I started this channel and this whole series, the director's commentary on Motu Classics during the COVID pandemic, because we were all stuck at home and looking for something to do. And I said, hey, you know, back when I was running the line, I had a, uh, a blog I, I was doing, kind of giving a behind the scenes talk of how each figure was made. And I think we only made it up through Scareglow or maybe even a little before him. And before I just ran, I didn't have time. And I think even management asked me to stop doing it. <laughs> because like, you need to focus on, you know, other things than blogging. I guess that's all I do these days, people would think. All right. Point being is, during the pandemic, I thought, hey, I'll take that blog and turn it into a vlog. And, uh, well, five years later, four and a half years later, whatever it is, I can't count. Um, here we are, and we have gone through every single Masters of the Universe Classics release between Mattel and Super 7. We didn't cover the animated figures. That would be a whole other series. But, wow, I mean, to say this brought back memories and brought back things I haven't thought about is, I mean, that's just barely scraping the surface. This line was a labor of love. It started off as a crazy idea to sell 2000X He-Man toys online. And when the Horsemen showed up at Comic-Con 2007 with what was the prototype for classics, we quickly pivoted and said, okay, instead of continuing 2000X, it makes so much more sense to start over with a new line, um, which is, and this is sort of a Marvel Legends style, call it, you know, a six inch scale He-Man line. And as opposed to 2000X was stylized and about four and a half, five inches. No, it was, more, it was five inches. It wasn't four and a half. So that, that, that was what changed Russian. And that really does reflect so many things about the toy industry and, and what we even see, even with the Masters brand now, is that the main characters sell the best. So you always want to start over. Classics was able to go as deep as it did because uniquely it wasn't dependent on retailers. It was dependent on us, the subscribers, uh, you know, the fan base. And because of that, we were able to go deeper than, I mean, outside of Star Wars and maybe 1980s G.I. Joe, I don't think any toy line's ever gone this deep. Um, I mean, we, we, we've got, we got to everybody. We did the entire vintage line, completed. That was such a victory, and it was, it was a goal. And to be able to do that required such strategy and multi-year continuity, shall we say, the fact that we had the same designer, the same marketing person, the same packaging person. Um, we, were able to, we were able to keep the same team for a good chunk. And all toys are a, a uh, like movie making is a, a cohesive, you know, project. It's not the vision of one person, uh, you know, between the Four Horsemen and Bill Beneke and Frank Varela. Everyone who touched this line, it, it, was, it was all a labor of love because we were basically doing it in addition to our day jobs. I mean, my, my day job was managing the DCU line at retail. Maddie and Motu became kind of a, a pet project and a passion project that probably put way too much passion in. And, but, but wow, I'm so glad that we all did it because we now have this line and you know, there's other great He-Man lines out there. The original line, the Origins line, you know, the, the, the current six and a half line at retail, Masterverse or New Eternia changes its name, rightly so, in order to reboot as it should. Keep those main characters out there, guys. It's what toy companies need to do. Anyway, let's get, so, I don't know, it just, there, this, just to say classics, I made a video a while back about it being lightning in a bottle. And it really was, especially for the cost because costs have skyrocketed. And they were, I mean, they were going up while we were doing it. And the, I mean, if you remember, the original figures in 2008, 2009 were $20. And back then, that was like scoffed at, like, oh my God, a $20 figure. Uh, you know, now if Classics was out, it'd probably be about $60 um, a figure, I'm guessing. Kind of like what Super 7 does. I mean, what Super 7 does with their Ultimates. And I'll say it again, Super 7 is the perfect company to be handling something like Classics. I hope that maybe they get the license back. Um, I have no knowledge of any of that, but that is where a line, it either needs to be a small toy company that doesn't have overhead, 
or if it's a large company, the program we did with the subscriptions. Uh, and it's all because of you guys. I mean, the subscribers made it happen. We, we literally, when I was out there just begging people to subscribe, that was real. If we didn't hit those numbers, the line was done. And because New Adventure fans, you know, supported Princess of Power fans and, you know, likewise, uh, you know, vice versa, visa versa, we all came together. And it was so much fun going to PowerCon and, and, and San Diego and New York to the conventions while the line was going on and, you know, hearing from people in person, <laughs> especially because in person everyone was a lot nicer than they are online. Just look at the YouTube comment section on this video for anything about that. Um, but no, I mean, it was... When I say it was a labor of love, it was also a labor of love by the fans. Because, again, you, you were subscribing figure unknown just for love of the brand to keep it going. I mean, and the the reach. I mean, you know, doing so many figures and, you know, really closing out the line. You know, kind of from King Skull to Dare, Son of He-Man. Uh, you know, and, of course, the Super 7 line. Uh, you know, filled in some filmation, necessary filmation gaps, which <laughs> were part of the original 2016, 2017 line. But it doesn't matter who makes them, just as long as somebody did. Because uh, they were needed. And, you know, like, Stridor had to be done in order to complete the line. It would have felt really weird to only have Night Stalker, Snake Mountain. It was great to see a company pick that up. So much work went into that to see it actually developed. Um, I'm sure one day I will pick one up when I, when I have a bigger office. I'm a little uh, lackluster for space at the moment. So... I want to thank you guys for sticking through this whole director's commentary. I, you know, I hope it's been enjoyable. It's kind of also a good way to know who's the most popular He-Man character. You can sort of look at just the uh, the that that playlist and see, you know, based on views. It's like Scareglow has like way more than anyone else. So, you know, so it's like sort of proof how popular he is. Uh, it just kind of wrapping things up, talking about some of my favorite memories besides, you know, going to conventions. I mean... I remember sit, being at New York Comic Con with the Four Horsemen, and we were sitting up upstairs in a in sort of a conference room that views you can see the floor through a the window, and we were literally like going through like the 2011 or 2012 line, like going through figure by figure, talking about what accessories they were going to come come with, and we were basically just beating out the whole year in this meeting, and it was just we were all sitting thinking, wow. We're all in a meeting. This is like toy history happening, and we're in it. And we knew we were in it, and it felt really awesome because the line was was you know it, this was before you know it started. We started you know got expensive in twenty thirteen and fourteen, and it sort of started going downhill. Um, but and this was sort of the peak of the line, I guess 2011, 2012 with Castle Grayskull. So this was when we felt, I mean, the line felt unstoppable. You know, subscriptions were just up every year. We were adding things. We were adding a castle. You know, all this was because of sales. And I, I remember all of us, Bill Beneke, you know, the horsemen, we were sitting in this in this New York Comic Con conference room. Or it might have been New York Toy Fair. I just remember being the Javits. And we were like, yeah, this is, this is He-Man toy history that we're all literally in. And this is awesome because... It's being done by fans, by people who played with the toys and loved the toys. And, you know, I think that's what really made the line special is everyone who was working on it. Again, it was a, such a passion project because, I mean, for the horsemen, it was, you know, that was their main job was sculpting whatever Mattel told them to sculpt. But for everyone else at Mattel, for the team, it, it, it was, you know, above and beyond, you know, doing their day job. And that's why the, I feel like the line came out so well is because we we were making toys that we wanted to make the best possible. I mean, you know, Roboto happening. I remember that was on Bill's watch. When, and Bill and I spent so much time trying to make sure the gears worked. They all had to be cast separately because you couldn't paint them or the paint would chip. We spent so much time on that that we didn't notice that the shoulders were, were reversed. And when that happened, we were just so crushed because we went like, we, I mean, we would stay late and work weekends just to make Roboto's gears do what it did, just turn like that. And all that work, and we missed the shoulders, and we just felt so stupid. But it just goes to show, like, how much love was going. Because we, we didn't have to make Roboto's gears. They could have just been solid. That's actually how it was, you know, management wanted it done. They're like, it's cheaper, it's easier. They don't need to rotate. There's no, there are no action features. But we just felt Roboto wasn't Roboto if the gears didn't rotate. And we spent so much more. We spent about three times as much on Roboto than we did any other figure and lo and behold we screwed up the shoulders and then King hisses shoulders under Terry and uh, that was always heartbreaking because again we were making this with passion and when something slipped through like that and it was because of the low runs you know with main toy lines the runs are so much higher that you get test samples these runs were so small they were small enough they didn't even deserve a test sample so we were basically just 
the production was the test sample, which is why these kind of things happen. All because the runs were just so small, especially for a company like Mattel that's used to doing runs in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. So it was a very different thing. Mattel really stepped up supporting this because they didn't need to, um, you know, but they saw the advantages, not only monetarily, but it became kind of a feather in Mattel's cap to get new licenses, you know, like, oh, yeah, we have this great arm to, you know, do direct to consumer collector figures. So you know, that was how M M Mattel acquired things like Ghostbusters and Voltron. And, um, you know, the, it became part of Mat one of Mattel's core competencies when pitching for new licenses. So, you know, obviously that was why they continued to support it. But they didn't need to originally. It was because of people like Doug Wadley and Tim Kilpin, John Blaney, P.J. Lewis, uh, Jim Murphy. Uh, these were some of the marketing people that really helped get it off the ground. Um, Johnny O'Neill, who helped do the original PowerPoint pitch to management when I was still a copywriter in Hot Wheels before I switched over. Um, so, yeah, everyone just knew this. If, if we put in the work, we could do something really awesome. And... I'm so grateful for the experience. The other quick uh, little stories, I, I remember working on the rollout and the bios, and this was in 2000, you know, seven, 2008. My daughter had just been born. So I tended to, this was kind of like while I was up late at night, you know, like, you know, anyone who's been a new parent knows you spend two years not sleeping. And that was when I was working on, you know, I, I would have my laptop in our first tiny little apartment in uh, Culver City, California. And I had my full list of all the characters we had available to us, uh, and, you know, I, and I was putting them into this master spreadsheet to make sure the line could go. I, I had it out till 2018, which is crazy to think that. Um, then in 2013, we sort of sh shrank everything, and we took those last few years and turned them into three years instead of, like, ten uh, to make sure we got to everybody, but as part because prices were going up, but... The, the original time I remember at night and I would just spend so many nights, you know, kind of fine tuning it. Like, oh, no, no, no if we move this, we should move this character to this year because we have too many horde already or too many females or, you know, too many new event. You know, it was about spreading everything out. I'm like, oh, no, 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 this guy's going to be fully tooled. So, we you know, I have to move this one to a different year because we'll never be able to afford to do three fully tooled. Fig so much work went into that. And the fact that that roadmap was followed. 90% of the way, 80% of the way, I think was also a big part of the success. And then the other, you know, big contribution I had was the bios that, yes, I wrote all of the bios except for the uh, handful of filmation characters that came out in 2013, like Fang Man. Uh, that was by uh, Mary uh, Sadusky did those because she really wanted to. And I was happy to let her. I was so done. Um, it was hard to write these. They became I, the reason I did is because if I didn't, we didn't have a budget for you know a writer to come in and write these or anything. I mean, the original instructions were to put them in a white box because these were not going to retail. Why do you need a colorful package? And we had to make the whole case that no collectors also want to hang these on their walls, and a lot of people do keep them in packaging. Um, I'm looking at some of my packaging figures, you know. Oh. oh, of course, this is the one that's closest, isn't it? Mighty Spectre. Well, there you go, but I've got a whole bunch, but yeah. Um, it was originally, you know, they just put this in a, in a, in a, in a black box or a white box and ship it. So when, when we fought to get graphics, which is where we got the green brick, because we had that for the Cap Cape Grayskull San Diego Comic-Con figure. And that was the only thing we had graphic wise to use. So we're like, okay, well, that's going to be the brand colors then. And the back was going to just be green brick. And I said, well, let's use that. Let's, we could do a cross sell these because we can take photos of the figures and well, we can use a bio. And they're like, well, we don't have bios. We don't have card art. I'm like, if I provide it, if I provide the bios and the card art, well, can we do it? And upper manager was like, fine. Yeah, if you can provide that at no cost, you can do bios and card art. And that was sort of where it jumped up. And I was, a, I mean, I am still, but I was, a, you know, I was hired as a writer by Mattel. That was my first job in, in Hot Wheels. So I was, you know, clearly qualified to write. And it basically started as a process, you know, if we were going to do these, the whole point was to use them as a marketing tool. And so if we can get fans to keep guessing at the continuity or what a bio might be referring to, it was all deliberate just to get fans talking because we had no other content but the bios. We had no, no mini comics, no cartoons, no movies. So the bios were the content. And, uh, I'm actually going to, that's where we're going to go from here. I'm going to go bio by bio, and we're going to break them uh, 
break them up sentence by sentence and talk about how they were written. So that's sort of um, the transition that's going to be the next series following up this director's commentary. And uh, I will talk about how they were constructed, where a lot of the copy came from, because I tried to use as much existing copy as possible. And uh, that'll and we'll talk about the real names and where those came from for each character. People have been asking about that. So that's going to be the new series now that director's commentary is wrapped up. All right. This was literally me just blathering on, but it was for love. Wow. Thank you guys for supporting the line. Thank you for supporting the series. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, anything I missed, leave it in the comments. I could always do, you know, an addendum or something like that. So uh, happy trails, good journey, and uh, I'll see you at the next adventure. Thanks for sharing these videos, and uh, thanks for supporting the Spectra Creative channel. Be sure to like, share, and uh, comment below. It's the best way to support the channel. Thanks for watching. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.